History has a way of repeating itself, unfolding from its genesis to its revelation. We see this recurring pattern in the pages of Scripture, where certain biblical figures and historical events provide glimpses of what's to come. Today we embark on a journey through the tapestry of history, connecting the dots between biblical prophecy and the current global landscape. As we delve into this sermon, we must recognize that globalization, a force reshaping our world, has the potential to bring us closer to the fulfillment of biblical prophecies, particularly those concerning the Antichrist. Our exploration begins with a figure from the book of Genesis, Nimrod. Nimrod, described as a mighty hunter and builder of cities, has been associated with rebellion against God. While not explicitly labeled as an Antichrist in the Bible, the parallels between Nimrod's defiance and the spirit of the Antichrist are intriguing. His attempt to build a city and a tower to make a name for himself challenges God's divine plan. Moving forward in time, we encounter Antiochus IV Epiphanes, a historical figure from the 2nd century BCE. Though not a biblical character, his actions and persecution of the Jews including the desecration of the temple in Jerusalem, bear resemblance to the Antichrist's anticipated deeds. These historical echoes remind us that history has a way of repeating itself, with individuals and events foreshadowing what lies ahead. The heart of our discussion lies in the intersection of globalization and biblical prophecy. Globalization is the process of integrating societies, people and governments with the aim of influencing international interactions. Advances in medicine, communication, and education, driven by developments in science and technology, play a significant role in achieving global unity. However, these same developments are also pushing us closer to the realization of biblical prophecies. Initially, when efforts to achieve international integration were initiated, the world welcomed them as lasting solutions to global economic, security, and communication challenges. From a Christian perspective, one can discern how globalization can be viewed as a path leading to the rule and reign of the Antichrist, who is prophesied to bring about a one-world order and government as foretold in the Bible. The first recorded attempt at globalization in Scripture can be found in Genesis 11:3-4, which states, And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. However, this endeavor contradicted God's command for humanity to multiply and subdue the earth, leading to a conflict with God's plan. Another historical form of globalization evident in Scripture is the practice of subjugation. The Assyrians were known for conquering nations and asserting their authority over them through warfare, torture, and enslavement. It was evident that they harbored ambitions of global conquest. Additionally, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as described in Daniel chapter 2, featured multiple empires, reflecting attempts to establish a one-world government. Nebuchadnezzar's practice of relocating conquered peoples to foreign lands and importing new foreigners into his domain aimed to suppress rebellion and coup attempts, further indicating his vision of a final world empire. This fifth world empire is yet to come. In summary, globalization is a complex phenomenon with both positive and potentially concerning implications, particularly when viewed through the lens of biblical prophecy and historical events as depicted in scripture. The Bible prophesies the coming of the Antichrist, who will lead a united world. He is often referred to as the beast in the book of Revelation, while Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians identifies him as the lawless one. In Revelation 13, 15, 17, it is written, And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
The reality is that our society is increasingly interconnected and integrated, which aligns with biblical prophecy. Travel has become easier than ever, allowing people to journey from any part of the world to another within 48 hours. Communication is another example. As you listen to this sermon, thousands, possibly millions of Christians worldwide are hearing the same message, regardless of their location, whether it's a different state, city, country, or continent. We often take such global connectivity for granted, but it was inconceivable 200 years ago. As technology advances, we witness the fulfillment of biblical prophecy more clearly. Consider Revelation 11.9, where the two witnesses are killed by the beast from the abyss. Revelation 11.9 states, For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. In the past, people questioned how this verse could be feasible, doubting that the entire world could witness an event simultaneously. However, with technological advancements, televisions, and handheld devices, people can now follow global events in real time. What was once implausible 200 years ago is now possible today. Therefore, it's not difficult to believe that for three and a half days, people from nearly all tribes, languages, and nations will witness the bodies of the two witnesses. The Antichrist is prophesied to rule over all nations, and we can observe that nations are moving towards greater unity. For example, the formation of the United Nations and the European Union is seen by many as a significant development related to end-time biblical prophecy. While these unions are not explicitly named in the Bible, they do appear to be symbolically suggested in prophecy such as Revelation 13, turn 1, Daniel 7, 16, 24, and Daniel 2, 41, 42. Bible prophecy is undeniably unfolding before our eyes. Consider, for instance, the introduction of the mark of the beast. To implement his system, the Antichrist will need to monitor individuals on a large scale, and one notable technology facilitating this is facial recognition technology, FRT. For an alarming number of us, facial recognition technology has become an increasingly integrated part of everyday life. From unlocking our phones and accessing online banking, to having our faces scanned against criminal databases, FRT has seen exponential growth. Experts predict that the global facial recognition market will more than double from 3.8 billion USD in 2020 to 8.5 billion USD in 2025. Even seemingly innocuous places like modern shopping malls employ hidden cameras within digital advertising billboards, which can not only discern your age and gender, but also your mood. This allows for the rapid tailoring of advertisements using facial detection technology. It's highly likely that cameras are monitoring you even when you are outside your home. For example, when I recently downloaded my car manufacturer's app, I discovered it had recorded my car's travel history for the past two years. It even provided details like the duration of my parking at specific locations. These technological advancements and monitoring practices, which we now take for granted, will play a role in enabling the rule and reign of the Antichrist on the world stage. We live in an age where technological advancements have reached incredible heights, and among these breakthroughs is the remarkable technology of gate recognition. In a world increasingly interconnected and reliant on digital authentication, gate recognition stands out as a unique biometric method that identifies individuals by the way they walk. Gate recognition, also known as biometric gait analysis, delves into the intricacies of a person's walking pattern. It takes into account factors such as rhythm, speed, stride length, and other distinctive characteristics that make each individual's gait unique. This technology captures and analyzes the data generated by a person's walking motion, creating a distinct biometric profile that can be employed for identification or authentication purposes. The applications of gate recognition are diverse, ranging from enhancing security measures to enabling seamless access control systems. What sets gate recognition apart is its effectiveness in situations where traditional biometric methods like fingerprint or facial recognition may not be suitable or available. Gate recognition systems typically employ cameras and sophisticated computer algorithms to accurately capture and assess an individual's gait as they walk. 
The ongoing efforts to achieve absolute globalization will significantly aid the Antichrist's mission. He aims to unify the world's religions, economy, and security, ultimately requiring everyone to worship the image of the beast. He will oppose anything associated with God establishing himself as God on earth. To consolidate global economic control, he will introduce the mark of the beast, a mark without which people will be unable to engage in any financial transactions worldwide. Additionally, the Antichrist will command the world's military forces. Throughout Scripture, whenever the concept of globalization was presented, it ran counter to the will of God. The events at the Tower of Babel, for example, resulted in the confusion of a single language spoken by the world's inhabitants. God dispersed them, leading to the formation of different language groups. God also thwarted the Assyrians' ambitions when they sought to subdue the ten northern tribes of Israel and liberate the Babylonian-held Israelites. Satan, the god of this world, has long seen globalization as a means to gain control over all earthly kingdoms. Consider the unsettling fact that the Antichrist opposes the worship of the Almighty God. Refusal to worship the beast will result in persecution and punishment. Conversely, receiving the mark of the beast and worshiping it means eternal separation from God. The Antichrist will be energized by the very power of hell. God does not view the Antichrist, who is the beast from the sea, and the false prophet, the beast from the earth, as men made in the divine image of God. Instead, God views them as beasts, as wild animals, under the control of the dragon, Satan. This is so important, and it sheds light on the fact that all other human beings who have lived and do not accept Christ will be judged at the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15. However, only two human beings, only two unredeemed human beings miss out on this great white throne judgment, the Antichrist and the false prophet. They are not even judged. They are directly cast into the lake of fire. This should show you that these two people are not normal individuals. These two people will be fueled by a level of evil unlike the world has ever seen before. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The Antichrist will be evil like no other. Just as Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, so the beast will be Satan in a human body, and he has the number 666. Anytime you see the number 666, you need to be aware and cautious, for that is not a number you want to be associated with. Many rock bands and media outlets play with the number 666, but that number is something you should not want anything to do with. I remember a few decades ago, I bought a phone and three of the numbers in that mobile number were 666. I said, no thank you, sir, and called the provider to get that number changed. Imagine being a pastor, handing out your number to people, and then saying 666. That is not a good look. Never have anything to do with that number, for it is the number of a man. It is the number of a beast. Now today, I want to talk about the day the world chose the mark of the beast. In the panorama of biblical prophecy, one of the most riveting scenes is undoubtedly when the mark of the beast is introduced and accepted. The world will choose the mark of the beast, just the same way the world chose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. This stark and chilling moment in future history is more than just an end time spectacle. It holds a profound mirror to humanity's choices and allegiances. Choices have consequences, and we are all given a choice. Choices have consequences. Remember that the beast is a counterfeit Christ. It's crucial to understand this. The Antichrist is Satan's master, attempt to mock, mimic, and malign the genuine Savior, Jesus Christ. Satan has always been about imitation, albeit a twisted one. Just as false coinage reveals the value of true currency, so the appearance of the Antichrist underscores the value and verity of Jesus Christ. However, here's the bitter irony. This world would not receive the true Jesus Christ, but it will receive the Antichrist. 
It's a choice that resonates with profound consequences. Choices have consequences. Each and every one of us, when we are born in this life, is given the option to make choices, and our choices bear eternal consequences. Not a single one of us will cease to exist 100 years from now, or a thousand years from now, or even a million years from now. The choices we make are eternal. Choices have consequences. We live in a world that attempts to sugarcoat, a world that tries to blur the lines, a world that tries to hide the fact that choices have consequences. Although the mark of the beast is not in operation today, you and I have a choice to make. It's either Jesus Christ or the Antichrist. In one way or another, there's no middle ground. The days the world rejected Christ is when the world tacitly, perhaps unknowingly, accepted the Antichrist and the markings of his dominion. The day the world chose the mark of the beast was not a sudden leap into darkness, but a culmination of many choices made in rejection of the light of the world. You see, if we reject Jesus Christ, it's almost inevitable that we'll accept the Antichrist. One can't simply remain neutral in matters of eternal significance. When Jesus proclaimed, he who is not with me is against me, he presented a dichotomy that stands true even in end time scenarios. When we push away truth, there's only one thing left to embrace, deception. There's no middle ground. When we push away truth, there's only one thing left to embrace, deception. There is no middle ground. And how this world has pushed away the truth that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The world rejected the truth of Jesus Christ, but tragically, the world will believe the lie of the Antichrist. It's as if humanity's spiritual compass, having lost its true north, will be all too willing to follow a false magnetic pull and how this false magnetic pull will come. The world will have never seen one like the Antichrist. People will love him and worship him, and those who do not love him and worship him will be coerced into worshiping him. Furthermore, consider the depths of deception. The world will not worship Christ, the one who bore their sins, the one who wore the crown of thorns and extended grace freely. Yet they will bow down to the Antichrist, the embodiment of everything opposed to grace, love, and truth. It reminds me of Jesus' words in John chapter 5, verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. The essence of this verse highlights how choices have consequences. Choices can either lead to life or usher in calamity, particularly eternal calamity. The world's choice to reject Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the embodiment of love, grace, and truth, opens the door for a substitute that is a polar opposite, the Antichrist, who embodies hatred, lawlessness, and deception. The day the world chose the mark of the beast won't merely be a day of temporal consequence. It will reveal the eternal consequence of the choices humans have been making all along. Ultimately, we understand that God's aim is to establish his reign under the rule of Christ. However, Satan seeks to counterfeit God's original purpose. As stated in Revelation 11:15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This passage indicates that all the kingdoms of this world will eventually come under the control and influence of Christ. Importantly, this doesn't imply that Christ will be a tyrant king. It is clear from scripture that individual nations will coexist under Christ's rule. Zechariah 2.10.11 declares, Shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, says the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The remarkable aspect of Christ's kingdom is that it will be established on principles of righteousness and justice. In that era, we will be liberated from the troubles and evils associated with the current state of the world. The kingdom of Christ promises great joy and freedom. In the new earth, where all things are united in Christ, we will walk as free people. We will share the greatest joy in knowing that God's tabernacle will be among us. As Revelation 21.3 proclaims, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, 
and God himself will be with them and be their God. One of the reasons people will take the mark of the beast. John 3, 18 to 21. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. There exists a profound longing within humanity for God. Many individuals attempt to fill this void with various worldly pursuits, such as alcohol, sex, relationships, or money. However, it's essential to understand that while money can elevate one's standard of living, it cannot truly satisfy the innate desire for God's presence. Another desire within humanity, born out of sin, is a yearning for darkness. The Bible unequivocally states that people often prefer darkness over light because their actions are sinful. In this world, there are individuals who acknowledge the reality and truth of God's Word, recognizing Jesus as their Lord and Savior, yet they consciously reject Him. Why? Because sadly many favor darkness over light. We have heard much about the events that will define the last days, and one of the most prominent among them is the acceptance of the mark of the beast. Despite numerous scriptural warnings against receiving this mark and the severe eternal consequences associated with it, people persist in hardening their hearts to God's truth. Even though God will call upon the 144,000, raise the two witnesses, and send three angels to warn against taking the mark of the beast, many in this world will still resist the truth. Why? Because people tend to prefer darkness over light. One of the reasons people will embrace the mark of the beast is their inclination toward darkness. Walking in darkness signifies following a path of sin, despising righteousness and celebrating ungodliness. Those who choose to walk in darkness understand the significance of the light, but opt for darker paths to conceal their sinful deeds. They prioritize the fleeting pleasures of sin over enduring righteousness, especially when the beast emerges in the last days. The beast will promote the interests of those embracing darkness, offering them prosperity. Consequently, many will accept his mark, even if it means turning away from God for the sake of momentary pleasures. When the mark of the beast is introduced, there will be people who unquestionably recognize the existence of God, but will actively reject Him, choosing the mark instead. It's crucial to remember an age-old truth. Knowledge of God doesn't always lead to faith in Him. Even demons acknowledge God's existence, yet they rebel against Him. In our current generation and the generation living during the mark of the beast's era, there will be individuals who acknowledge God's existence but will adamantly refuse to worship or repent. Why? Because regrettably, many are drawn to darkness rather than the light. In Revelation 6 we see Jesus' opening of the seven seals of God's judgment. Revelation chapter 6 and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. 
and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Let's focus on Revelation 6, 16, which reads, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. This verse reveals the profound dread that those facing the Lamb's judgment experience. From the strongest to the weakest among them, they desperately implore the mountains and rocks to bury them, shielding them from God's presence and the impending wrath of the Lamb. To them, the prospect of perishing in an avalanche seems preferable to enduring God's judgment. Despite acknowledging God's supreme rule from His throne, they obstinately refuse to repent and submit to His authority. This statement holds significant importance because, at this moment, the people of the earth comprehend that they are the targets of divine wrath, specifically the wrath of Jesus Christ, the Lamb. This catastrophic event compels humanity to reluctantly acknowledge a truth that many have suppressed. They are ultimately accountable to God. This response aligns with other passages in Scripture, highlighting that mere knowledge of God does not always lead to genuine faith in Him. The love of darkness is steadily infiltrating even into churches worldwide. There are churches where attendees can go for an entire year without hearing a sermon on the topic of sin. This isn't to suggest that Christians don't sin, of course they do. However, there is a stark contrast between a Christian who actively strives to live a righteous life continually shedding their old self and embracing the new, and an individual who revels in sin and accepts it as an integral part of their existence. The key difference between a saved person and an unsaved person when they sin is that one seeks forgiveness and repents, while the other carries on without remorse because sin has become second nature to them. When the mark of the beast emerges, it will be promoted by the Antichrist himself, who will introduce various forms of immorality into the world. Astonishingly, the world will embrace him for this very reason. Why? Because, as Scripture warns, people often prefer darkness over light. Not everyone will be coerced into accepting the mark of the beast, 
Some will willingly embrace it because they love the system established by the Antichrist. The Bible alerts us that the spirit of the Antichrist is already present in the world. Indeed, the spirit of the Antichrist is actively preparing the world for his arrival and the introduction of his mark. The Antichrist spirit is among us, subtly at work, although many may not perceive it. In the apocalyptic narrative of Revelation 6, the mark of the beast emerges as a profound symbol of humanity's love for darkness, and its significance is magnified by its relation to the broader context of the book of Revelation. As we delve into this ominous topic, it becomes increasingly evident that the love for darkness has permeated our generation, as many embrace and applaud wickedness without hesitation. The question that resounds throughout this discussion is, don't you see it? Revelation 6 and the unveiling of darkness. Revelation 6 reveals the opening of the seven seals of God's judgment, an event of unparalleled significance in biblical prophecy. As these seals are broken, various calamities and catastrophes befall the earth, each signifying a different facet of God's judgment. The significance of these events lies not only in their immediate consequences, but also in their profound spiritual implications. Amidst these events, the emergence of the mark of the beast stands as a chilling moment in prophetic history. As the fourth seal is opened and a pale horse named Death appears, the hearts of humanity are exposed. They cry out to the mountains and rocks, pleading for concealment from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Don't you see it? In our generation, the love for darkness has become increasingly conspicuous. We witness the glorification of sinful deeds, the celebration of ungodliness, and the adoration of wickedness. What was once hidden in the shadows now boldly parades itself in the light. Actions that were once deemed reprehensible are now embraced and praised. In our world today, the love for darkness is palpable and it's impossible to deny its existence. Embracing darkness. Willingly, the mark of the beast is not merely a physical mark but a symbol of allegiance and submission to the Antichrist and his system. Shockingly, some will willingly embrace this mark despite their awareness of the darkness it represents. Don't you see it? They will recognize the Antichrist's true nature, understand the implications of the mark, and acknowledge God's warnings against it. Yet, their hearts will remain aligned with the Antichrist's system. Their decision to accept the mark is not born out of ignorance, but a conscious choice driven by their love for darkness. Their attachment to the Antichrist's regime, the allure of momentary pleasures, and the refusal to relinquish sinful desires will lead them down this perilous path. In their eyes, the Antichrist represents power, prosperity and indulgence, and they willingly follow him, despite knowing the darkness he embodies. The Overarching Warning as we contemplate the significance of the mark of the beast, the warning echoes loudly. Don't you see it? It serves as a sobering reminder that our generation is not immune to the lure of darkness. We must remain vigilant, guarding our hearts and minds against the enticement of sin and worldly allurements. In Revelation 6, the cry for the mountains and rocks to fall upon humanity signifies their dread of God's judgment. It also reveals the profound tension between knowledge and faith, as some recognize the reality of God, but choose rebellion. We must heed this warning and encourage others to do the same. In conclusion, the mark of the beast is a stark symbol of humanity's love for darkness, and its significance is deeply intertwined with the broader context of Revelation 6. In the unfolding of history, from a Christian perspective, it is important to remember there is a scheduled timeline of events. And throughout this timeline, time and time again, a man appears, a man shrouded in mystery, a man shrouded in darkness. This man, 
an enigma wrapped in prophetic writings, walks in the shadows of future history, leaving footprints that are both elusive and profound. His presence, his spirit, is already in the world today, yet his arrival is anticipated. His arrival is like a dark cloud that looms over the horizon, casting a long shadow over the unfolding saga of mankind's history. The man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the first beast, the son of perdition, is coming. As we live our lives each day in the end of days, it becomes increasingly more evident that we are not merely passive spectators, but active participants in a narrative of epic proportions. We are living in the last days the Bible warned us about. We are living in the last days the Bible speaks of. We are living in Matthew chapter 24. We are living in the beginning of sorrows. We are living in an age of wars and rumors of wars. We are living in an age where nations are rising against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. We are living in an age of famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. The notion that the world is at a crossroads is not cliché. It's a stark reality for those who see the world through the lens of the Bible. The clock of history is not just ticking, it is pulsating with the heartbeat of prophetic fulfillment. This ticking is not a mere counting down, but a counting towards. Because history is not moving here, there, and everywhere. The Bible is clear history is moving from a beginning in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. And it is moving towards an end in Revelation chapter 22. Therefore, this ticking is not a mere counting down, but a counting towards prophetic fulfillment, a counting towards the book of Revelation, a counting towards the consummation of all things. Every tick, every talk, is a step closer to the arrival of a conclusion scripted by God. We are not talking tonight of an airy-fairy invention. We are talking about the ticking of the clock, and the turning of the calendar, and the passing of the years, which is inexorably, unceasingly, unstoppably moving to the arrival of this man of sin, the first beast, the lawless one, the son of perdition, the wicked one, the Antichrist himself. Today's world is woven with threads of uncertainty and tension. The fabric of peace seems to be unraveling at an alarming pace. A cursory glance at headlines on any major news channel will show you that there is a tremendous amount of global tension between different nations and kingdoms. Each day, the headlines are a testament to a global community on the brink, with nations poised in a delicate balance that could tip into the abyss of a catastrophic World War III. It's a reality that cannot be ignored. The world is witnessing an increase in conflicts and confrontations, not seen in recent memory. Tensions simmer in regions known and unknown, from the long-standing strife in the Middle East to the rising unease in Europe, from the South China Sea's territorial disputes to the ever-volatile tensions in other parts of the world. The chessboard of international politics is laid bare, with each move bringing a potential spark that could ignite the tinderbox of global conflict. In this context, and with this backdrop, a question arises. Will the Antichrist stop World War III? To answer this question, we must first understand who the Antichrist is. The Antichrist, as described in the Holy Scriptures, is a figure shrouded in darkness and mystery. He is the end times false messiah, a master of deception, cloaked in the guise of a savior, but harboring intentions most sinister. His emergence is foretold as a pivotal moment in the grand narrative of biblical prophecy, a climax in the cosmic battle between good and evil. The Antichrist is not just another player on the world stage. He is a pivotal figure, prophesied to rise in power, achieving a level of global dominance unprecedented in human history. His ambition? To orchestrate the downfall of Israel, to crush the followers of Jesus Christ, and to establish his reign of terror. He is the embodiment of all that stands against God, a stark antithesis to the message of love and redemption that Christ brought to the world. The scriptures paint a vivid picture of his character, charismatic yet cunning, powerful yet pernicious, a leader who will captivate many with his promises of peace and prosperity, but whose heart beats with malevolent intent. The rise of the Antichrist, as prophesied, is not a matter of if, but of when. 
His ascension to power is intertwined with the unfolding events of the end times and the Book of Revelation, a period marked by turmoil and tribulation. In the Book of Revelation, his figure looms large, a central character in the drama that leads to the final showdown between light and darkness. But amidst this backdrop of prophecy and prediction, the question lingers in the air, almost tangible in its urgency. Will the Antichrist stop World War III? It's a question that stirs the soul. The truth is, Scripture does not explicitly state that the Antichrist will stop World War III. Anyone claiming he will or won't is offering their opinion. I personally do not believe there will be a World War III, simply due to the fact that the power of modern-day weaponry now is drastically different from what it was during the 20th century. The evolution of weaponry from World War I and II to the modern era represents a drastic transformation, marked by technological advancements that have fundamentally altered the nature of warfare. During World War I, combat was characterized by trench warfare and relatively primitive weapons like bolt-action rifles, machine guns, and mustard gas. Artillery was the dominant force on the battlefield, causing the majority of casualties. World War II saw significant advancements with the introduction of more sophisticated tanks, aircraft, and so on. Advancements in technology have given rise to smart weapons, unmanned systems like drones, and cyber warfare capabilities that can disrupt enemy infrastructure without a physical presence. Today's military arsenal includes precision-guided munitions, advanced missile defense systems, and stealth technology enabling forces to strike with remarkable accuracy from great distances. Nuclear weapons have also evolved, with today's arsenals capable of far more destruction than those used in World War II. The weaponry is so powerful that I do not believe there will be one before the Antichrist arrives. However, it is important to note that when the Antichrist does arrive, he will come as a man of peace. It is plausible and it could be a scenario where he stops the world from hurtling into war as a man of peace. Notice my choice of words. It is a plausible scenario. I'm not stating for one moment that this is what will happen. But the world would listen to a man who stops it from hurtling into war. The current global landscape, marked by significant political tensions and unrest, is not merely a coincidence, but a crucial piece in the prophetic puzzle. This climate of instability and disorder sets the stage for the emergence of the Antichrist. Leading up to the arrival of the Antichrist, the world will be in a state very similar to today. A divided world, a lot like the world we see today. The world in its current state is crying out for peace, a deep, resounding yearning that echoes across nations riven by conflict and division. This universal cry is for peace. The conditions we are witnessing are precisely the condition that could pave the way for the Antichrist, prophesied to rise as a beacon of false peace. In the Bible, Daniel 8.25 foretells, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. This passage vividly depicts the Antichrist's deceptive nature, using peace as a guise for his true intentions. Another Bible verse that supports the claim the Antichrist will arrive as a figure who initially appears as a bringer of peace is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They will perceive the world as being in a state of peace and security, but this tranquility will be abruptly shattered, akin to how labor pains suddenly seize a pregnant woman. During the early stages of the tribulation, a period of trials and tribulation following the rapture, unbelievers will be lulled into a deceptive sense of peace and safety. However, this period of calm will prove to be fleeting and misleading. In Daniel 9.27, Scripture speaks of a peace treaty indicating an agreement that will be forged by the Antichrist and then broken midway through the tribulation period. Daniel 9.27 And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, 
and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The passage details a period of apparent peace or stability initiated by this enigmatic figure. The covenant with many for one week is typically understood as a seven-year treaty, a period symbolic of completeness in biblical numerology. This covenant is particularly significant because it implies a temporary period of peace or normalcy. However, the prophecy foretells a betrayal of this agreement. In the middle of the week, which would be after three and a half years, the Antichrist will break this covenant. This abrupt shift marks a pivotal moment in eschatological events. In simple terms, this passage is often interpreted as the Antichrist making a peace treaty or covenant, particularly with Israel, for seven years, but breaking it halfway through, revealing his true nature. Revelation 6, 2 And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. Among Bible scholars, there is a general consensus that the first rider of the four horsemen of the Apocalypse is the Antichrist, the rider on the white horse. The choice of a white horse is particularly significant. In biblical symbolism, white often represents purity, righteousness, and victory. This color is commonly associated with Christ himself, especially in the context of his second coming, as depicted in Revelation 19.11. However, the writer in Revelation 6-2 presents a stark contrast. While the horse is white, symbolizing peace and righteousness, the actions of the rider do not align with these attributes. He carries a bow and is granted a crown, suggesting authority and intent to conquer, but significantly there is no mention of arrows, which implies a conquest achieved through nonviolent means, perhaps through cunning, diplomacy, or deception. The imagery of a white horse, typically symbolizing peace, is seen in contrast with his actions of conquering, suggesting a deceptive appearance of peace. In summary, the imagery of the rider on the white horse in Revelation, when interpreted as the Antichrist, serves as a powerful metaphor for the ultimate deceiver. He is a figure who appears as a beacon of hope and peace, symbolized by the white horse, but whose underlying purpose is conquest and domination as indicated by his actions and the crown of authority he wears. The Antichrist's ascent to power will be marked by his portrayal as a man of peace, a charismatic leader emerging from the chaos of global unrest. He will offer solutions to the world's myriad problems, seducing many with promises of stability and harmony. And I do believe if an individual were to come and offer peace to this world we are living in, people would look up to that man, and even dare I say it, even worship him. What is the one thing the world is crying for right now? That is peace. I am not saying for one moment the Antichrist is coming in 2024. The truth is, I do not know when he will come. However, my point is simple. To urge you to look at the world's desperate need and calls for peace and also look at the Bible's description of how the Antichrist will rise as a man of peace. And I sometimes wonder at how the Antichrist will unite the world into peace and unite the world in accepting him alone as its leader. The fact that the world will unite under the leadership of this one man should show you several things, one of which is the level of deception and the sheer power of the Antichrist's deception. When in history has all of mankind listened and obeyed the rule of one man? When in history has the world come together in peace under the rule of one man? When in history has the world viewed one man as God? When in history have people put aside their social political ideologies to follow one man? When in history has all of mankind put their religious beliefs aside to worship one man? When in history has the entire world been required to bear a mark or symbol as a means of allegiance to a single leader? When in history has there been a global economic system so tightly controlled that buying and selling are impossible without allegiance to one ruler? When in history has a leader been able to perform miraculous signs and wonders on such a scale that they deceive nations? When in history has a single political figure managed to broker peace in the Middle East, particularly between Israel and its neighbors? 
When in history has a leader risen with such charisma and authority that their rule is accepted across diverse and often conflicting cultural boundaries? The Bible tells us when in history this takes place and that is in Revelation chapter 13. We grossly underestimate the pure and sheer supernatural deception that will occur during the rise of the Antichrist. What he will do is nothing short of supernatural. It will not be a natural accomplishment. But we know that he will not naturally accomplish this, for we know he is given his power by the dragon, and he is energized by the very gates of hell itself. In this world, woven with threads of uncertainty and tension where the fabric of peace seems to be unraveling, I come to you with a message of unshakable assurance. God is still on his throne. Yes, in the midst of a global unrest, in the face of threats and fears, let us remember this foundational truth. God is still on the throne. Think about it. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the river, and that voice from heaven declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God was on his throne. And even when John the Baptist faced his tragic end, beheaded for his unwavering faith, God was still reigning supremely. God is still on the throne. This truth, my brothers and sisters, is our anchor in the storm. As we navigate through these times, times that the Bible has warned us about, times filled with wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, let us hold on to this truth. God is still on the throne. Uh, we might be living in what seems like the beginning of sorrows, an era that looks like the unfolding events of the book of Revelation. But even then, even when the Antichrist takes center stage in human civilization, I need you to know, I need you to believe, I need you to hold on to this. God is still on the throne. In your personal life, when disaster strikes, when your world seems to crumble, when you feel all alone, remember this, God is still on the throne. His sovereignty is not dependent on our circumstances. His reign is not determined by the chaos of this world. His power is not diminished by the schemes of man or the rise of any antichrist. No, God is still on the throne. You see, things do not have to turn out the way we think they ought to for God to be sovereign. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. When we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Even in the midst of turmoil, even when the nations are in uproar, God is still on the throne. Our focus should not be solely on the prophetic fulfillments, not just on the ticking of the clock towards the end times. Our focus should be on the one who holds time in his hands, the one who sits above all the earth, the one who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. God is still on the throne, so do not be troubled. Do not let your heart be weighed down by fear. Do not look at the chaos of the world in despair. Instead, look to God who is unchanging, steadfast, and sovereign. Look to God whose love for us was so great that he sent his only son to save us. Look to God, who has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. In every moment, in every situation, in every high and every low, let this be your declaration, let this be your faith, let this be your unwavering conviction. God is still on the throne. Globalism involves trying to bring different groups together under one leader or set of ideas. Even though the word globalism is new and usually refers to countries working closely together today, there are biblical accounts that show us individuals and empires attempting to centralize control. One of the most notable examples of early globalism in the Bible is the story of the Tower of Babel, found in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. This is perhaps the most famous instance of early globalization efforts, the attempt to build the Tower of Babel around the 21st century BC. This act was in direct disobedience to God's command to populate the earth as mentioned in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. According to the narrative, humanity speaking a single language congregated in the land of Shinar, Babylonia, and decided to build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens to make a name for themselves and prevent their dispersal across the earth. In simple terms, mankind rebelled, deciding to centralize in one city and not be scattered over the earth as instructed by God. The construction of the Tower of Babel was led by King Nimrod, who was Noah's great-grandson. 
Nimrod's name, often interpreted to mean rebel, reflects his defiance in leading such an ambitious endeavor. This endeavor was undoubtedly an act of pride and rebellion against God, leading to divine intervention. God confused their language, causing them to no longer understand each other, and scattered them over the face of the earth, thus thwarting their efforts at unification and centralization. Nimrod the hunter is sometimes viewed as a type of antichrist, a foreshadowing of the antichrist, due to his defiance against God's authority. This rebellion, aimed at centralizing human power and possibly reaching heaven without divine approval, directly opposes God's command for humanity to spread out and populate the earth as seen in Genesis 9 verse 1. This defiance mirrors the Antichrist's opposition to God's authority as described in New Testament prophecies. Nimrod is often associated with the establishment of the first kingdom on earth, including several major cities in Mesopotamia, as seen in Genesis 10 to 10. His efforts to centralize power and control could be seen as precursors to the dominion the Antichrist is prophesied to hold over nations, consolidating political and religious power to challenge the authority of God. Though not explicitly stated in the Bible, traditional and extra-biblical interpretations suggest Nimrod may have been instrumental in introducing idolatry and false worship. These practices directly contravene the worship of the one true God, a characteristic action of the Antichrist, who, according to biblical prophecy, will exalt himself above all that is called God or is worshipped. In Christian eschatology, Nimrod's kingdom, particularly the Tower of Babel, symbolizes human pride, rebellion, and the attempt to achieve godlike status without God. This is why Nimrod is viewed by some Bible scholars as type of Antichrist. The Antichrist is similarly described as exalting himself and seeking worship, embodying human rebellion against God's sovereignty. There have been other attempts throughout biblical history for centralized power. All the empires presented in a dream to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia represent other attempts to institute a one-world government. Could it be that we are finally on the precipice of the arrival of the Antichrist? Could it be that technology has advanced to a stage where the rule of the Antichrist is no longer just probable but a certainty? Could it be that with the formation of economic unions and political alliances, the world is slowly shifting and aligning itself for the kingdom of the Antichrist? Could it be that current global events are laying the groundwork and preparing the stage for the Antichrist's emergence? Could it be that we are living in the times described in the book of Revelation? Could it be that what we are witnessing is the beginning of sorrows, with nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom? Could it be that we are observing the unfolding of history, the turning of the pages, and the arrival of the man of sin? Could it be that the growing acceptance of surveillance technology under the guise of security and convenience is setting the stage for the all-seeing eye of the Antichrist's rule? Could it be that the widespread turmoil, natural disasters, pestilences, wars, and rumors of wars are the birth pains leading up to the end times? Could it be that the call for global unity in addressing these crises is actually a step towards the global rule of the Antichrist foretold in Revelation? Could it be that the blurring lines between political, economic, and religious power are creating the perfect environment for the Antichrist's rise? Could it be that the increasing persecution of Christians and the marginalization of traditional moral values are fulfilling the prophecies of the last days? Could it be that we are witnessing the setup for the final battle between good and evil as foretold in the scriptures? Could it be that these observations are not mere coincidences, but signs that we are indeed living in the end times as prophesied in Revelation chapter 13? In the heart of Revelation, amidst the unfolding visions given to John, we find ourselves standing at the precipice of understanding the vast and unparalleled reach of the Antichrist's dominion. The reach and power of the Antichrist will be unlike anything the world has seen. He will surpass the power and reach of all great empires that have risen and fallen. From Nimrod to Alexander the Great, his empire will be larger. From the Mongolian Empire founded by Genghis Khan in the early 13th century to the British Empire, which covered nearly a quarter of the world's land area. The reach and control of the Antichrist will surpass all these empires and their leaders. 
Additionally, the Roman Empire, which once dominated the Mediterranean and beyond, and the Ottoman Empire, which spanned three continents and ruled for over six centuries, will pale in comparison to the authority wielded by the Antichrist. Indeed, the Antichrist's dominion will eclipse the global reach and influence of every empire that populates the annals of history, casting a shadow over the entire world. Here are two verses in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation that demonstrates the sheer scope and spread of the Antichrist power. Revelation 13, 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Revelation 13, 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Revelation 13, verse 7 and 13, verse 16 lay bare the reality of a world under the sway of this formidable ruler known as the beast that emerges from the sea. This beast, as foretold, is granted power to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. The gravity of this authority cannot be overstated. It heralds a time when the entire globe falls under a singular rule, a centralized control that knows no bounds. Where the world will be controlled by one man, one man energized by the very power of hell. Where the world will be controlled by one man who is empowered by Satan, the fallen one. The breadth of this control is further emphasized in the chilling mandate of Revelation 13:16, where the beast through its prophet requires all, regardless of status, wealth, or freedom, to bear a mark on their right hand or forehead. This is not merely a mark of allegiance, but a tool of unparalleled centralized control. It is an eternal mark of allegiance, one the like of which the world has never seen, a mark like no other, a mark where those who take it are viewed as doomed souls, destined for the lake of fire. Through this mark, the beast, the Antichrist, dictates the very ability to engage in the most basic economic transactions. This mark will dictate whether you can buy or sell. The message is clear. Without this mark, one is not only ostracized from society, but also stripped of the means to survive within it. Consider the implications of such control. In a world already tilting towards centralization, where digital currencies and global surveillance hint at the arrival of this man of sin, the scenario presented in Revelation feels eerily plausible not just eerily plausible, but somewhat probable. The Antichrist's regime will eclipse anything humanity has witnessed, creating a world where every dissenting voice is silenced and every act of defiance is met with swift retribution. This global reach is not merely about geographical dominance, but a comprehensive infiltration into the very fabric of society. It transcends social, economic, and political barriers, touching every life from the greatest to the least, from the rich to the poor, from the young to the old. The Antichrist's rule will permeate every tribe, language, people, and nation, leaving no corner of the earth untouched by his influence. Such is the depth of his reach that it compels a universal allegiance enforced by the mark that dictates participation in society. The centralized control exerted through the mark is a profound demonstration of power. It signifies not just physical control over the bodies of mankind, but a deeper, more insidious grip on their spiritual destinies. Revelation 14 verses 9 to 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The passage in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 10, unequivocally indicates that those who accept this mark are openly defying God. In essence, anyone who bears the mark of the beast is condemned. By embracing the beast's symbol, they demonstrate their lack of faith. The third angel reveals the fate awaiting the beast's adherents. Each of them will face the entirety of God's wrath. God is portrayed as pouring out his judgment without restraint, filling the cup of his anger to its brim. 
The global reach and centralized control of the Antichrist serve as a somber warning, casting a chilling shadow over the world's future. They lay bare the profound depths to which evil will ascend in the last days, manifesting through a leader who brazenly seeks to usurp God's rightful place in the order of creation. This looming reality evokes a sense of urgency and solemn reflection, compelling humanity to confront the stark implications of such unchecked power. Our contemporary world stands as a testament to unprecedented connectivity, an intricate web of technology, commerce, and communication that binds nations and peoples together in ways unimaginable to previous generations. Yet, it is precisely within this interconnected landscape that the seeds of the Antichrist's reign find fertile ground to take root and flourish. The very fabric of our global society, with its intricate networks and interdependencies, provides the stage upon which the Antichrist will orchestrate his tyrannical rule. In this age of rapid information exchange and seamless connectivity, the potential for centralized control to extend its reach into every corner of the globe is unprecedented. In all this, allow me to remind you, God is in control. Despite the swirling chaos of the world, his sovereignty remains unchallenged and his divine plan unfurls with purpose and precision. Throughout history, we have witnessed the rise and fall of empires, the ebb and flow of nations, yet amidst it all, God's hand guides the course of humanity. From the days of ancient Babylon to the present, his providence reigns supreme, transcending the schemes of mortal men. Consider the story of the Tower of Babel, a vivid reminder of humanity's pride and defiance. Despite their attempts to centralize power and elevate themselves to the heavens, God intervened, scattering them and confounding their language. In this act, he demonstrated his supremacy over the designs of mankind, reminding us that his will shall prevail. Even now, as we ponder the signs of the end times and contemplate the rise of the Antichrist, let us not succumb to fear or despair. For though the forces of darkness may seek to ensnare and deceive, God's light shines brightest in the darkest of days. The global reach and centralized control of the Antichrist may cast a shadow over the world's future, but rest assured, God's sovereignty remains unshakable. His power surpasses that of any earthly ruler, and his purposes will ultimately prevail. God is your protector. As we navigate these uncertain times, let us fix our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith, trusting in his unfailing love and unwavering faithfulness. Though the storms may rage and the seas may roar, we stand firm on the rock of his promises, knowing that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Take heart and be encouraged, for our God reigns supreme now and forevermore. Let us lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving, for he alone is worthy of all honor and glory. In his presence there is peace that surpasses all understanding and strength that sustains us through every trial and tribulation. So do not fear, dear friends, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Even in the darkest of nights, his light shines brightly, guiding you on the path of righteousness and truth. Trust in him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, for he is faithful and true to his promises.